Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, Next Level. It's a very, er, Next Level, uh, Dirty Mo Live. Uh, it's a very special Dirty Mo Live today. Uh, we had original plans to talk about, you know, recapping the season and all that, but obviously we lost one of the greatest NASCAR broadcasters of all time, Ken Squire. And so today's live show is going to be about talking about Ken and sharing some stories. We got to sit down with him on our Next Level series. That's where I got Can I correct you for a second? There. He's not one of the greatest NASCAR he broadcasters. He's the greatest. He's one of the greatest broadcasters. Yeah. Like, forget the sport. Yeah. yeah. I would agree with that. Um, so we this is going to be a special one today. We have Ryan McGee of ESPN calling in, Rick Allen of NBC calling in to share some stories um, about Ken, and uh, obviously we we have some stories of our own as, as we were just in Vermont last September to sit down and talk with him. We just posted the full-length interview, so you can go check yep. that out on our Dirty Mo platforms. <clears throat> you know, I was watching the whole thing earlier this week, and gosh, that thing is just, it's too good not to share in its entirety. So we're like, we got to post it. And so you can go watch the conversation start to finish. It's about two hours and 15 minutes, mm-hmm. something like that. So one of my favorite things is listening to a good storyteller. Oh, and Ken no is better than Ken. one of the best. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, if you if you love li- hearing some guys tell some good stories, go go watch that for sure. Yeah. Andrew Carlin, by the way, with Dalton Greco, Travis Rockhold um, here. But, yeah, it, it has been I don't know about you guys, but seeing all the tributes on social media and people posting their favorite Ken Squireism or, or their favorite call of his, or we're going to talk to McGee in a little bit. You know, they recreated the movie scene that Ken Squire was in. Uh, the tributes have been so cool to see this week and especially today. Like, uh, anything of your guys's like stick out to you as one of the cooler tributes you've seen i'm trying to pull up Dale's i mean I, while you're talking i yeah. i love seeing the 79 yes. call in that replay like yeah. that is just that that is the most iconic call i think in, in nascar history i think you know we were talking a little bit before the stream started that without someone like ken like we we would not be sitting here today yeah. doing what we're doing yeah. um you know that that propelled the sport in such a position that we were we're able to now reap the benefits of it, you know, some 50 years later, uh, almost. And, you know, it's one of those things that you don't realize how important he was until you get to a point like this. And I think that Dale mentioned that in his tweet a so little bit. Here's Dale's tweet. When I first got my job as an announcer on NBC, I wrote down a full page of Squireisms that the legendary Ken Squire used during his career. I tried to use one per race during my rookie broadcasting season. Ken is the standard of excellence for any non NASCAR broadcast. So for any broadcast. So, yeah. you know. And, and just uh that what made me think of that is Dave Moody told a great story and it's kind of similar to what Dale Dale did there and it's, it's like the Ken Squire school of broadcasting. You can learn so much from that and from that point is Dale tried to use one Squireism a race. Well, Dave Moody told me the greatest story last year that Ken Squire, one of the lessons was, I want you to go home and come up with 20 different ways to say side by side. Mm. And then come up with that. And he gave Ken the list, wheel to wheel, door to door, side by side. And Ken's like, I want you to use every single one of those mm. in the race tonight. People people don't want to hear the same thing twice. People don't want to hear it. And uh, I don't know that that's just like if you're a broadcaster, that is such a valuable like vocabulary. He was the king of that. It's not even for broadcasters. It's for people who are, you know, do anything in life. You know, don't don't necessarily do the same thing twice. You know, find new experiences, find new ways to explain and describe what you're seeing in front of you. Um, and that speaks to someone like me who deals with words a lot. Um, so yeah, I, I love it. Well, uh, we mentioned we're going to have some people calling into the show. Uh, Alex Timms, our producer here in the studio, is going to give Ryan McGee a call of ESPN. And uh, Travis, what was what was the movie scene? And we can ask McGee. What was the movie scene that I'm we were watching up of his? his uh, Twitter account. No, he did it a... It was in Stroker. It was, Stro- it was, it was the, the recreation, recreation of Stroker. Of Stroker. It was him and yeah. uh, Corey LaJoy. And so... Um, they did it, and then McGee tweeted that he showed it to Ken and asked him for a review. And Ken, this is a quote, I've seen better acting in a toilet paper commercial. Yeah, <laughs> and that's I think hilarious. that quote, like, uh, just watching videos and your interviews and stuff, Ken's sense of humor 
is just the delivery of it. It makes sense. He's such a great broadcaster, but yeah. it, it was perfect. Well, let's hear from McGee. I don't think he's. Yes. I think Tim's is hooking it up. He's hooking the system up uh, to get McGee here in the room. Ryan, do we got you? Yes, sir. How we are we doing? We got you. Good to hear from you, McGee. Good to hear from you, man. I've been watching. Uh, I've been watching a lot of you today. Those amazing uh, conversations that you have with Ken Squire. I think a lot of people have. So thank you for that. Yeah, it, I mean, I've said it so many times. Like that two days we got to spend in Vermont. Like I will cherish those forever. And uh, just to just to let the stories and let let Cam roll with the tapes, man. It was super cool. But uh, how are you doing? We were just just before we brought you uh, brought you on. We were talking about you recreating that scene of ken squire from from the movie stroker <laughs> yeah that was that great was, now that was so Corey LaJoy called this was two years ago he called and he goes hey man i got we have an idea and uh would you be willing to participate and he said you know i know you got to check your people and it's a sponsored thing or whatever else and so and so i go what is it he goes well we're going to recreate uh, Ken Squire scene from Stroke Race. I go, yeah, I'm not calling anyone. I'm just going to do that. So I didn't ask. I didn't ask for permission. I just showed up. And he and Corey goes, do you need me to send you a script? I go, no, nope, I know it. I know that scene. And so yeah, it was it was a great day. And and the funny part was, so it, it was the scene where where uh, Stroke Race and Lugs Harvey are arguing, and all of a sudden they 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 change their faces because Squire attacked them, you know, with the microphone and wanted the story. And Squire gets so angry, and he goes, just once. Just once, I want you guys to tell me the real story. And he drops a bad word. So I did the same thing. And I, Ken told me later, I asked him, I said, hey, did you see me do this thing for Stark Race? And he said, yeah. I said, what did you think? He goes, I've seen better acting in toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> and if you knew Ken, then you knew, yes, that was an insult, but that also was a, it was a compliment. So I took it. Yeah. McGee, what, what will be your lasting memory of your interactions with Ken? You know, it's funny because – it's special. And I, 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 we, we talk about this all the time. Those of us kind of my age, you know, me, Marty Smith, Nate Ryan, you know, Dusty Long, you know, Jennifer Iyer, those of us that showed up in the late nineties, we kind of caught the sport at this, at this crazy time. And Dale Jr. and I have talked about this where you were in the garage with the legends of the sixties and seventies and eighties and nineties. And you were also in the garage with, you know, with the, the Jeff Gordons and the Dale Juniors and, and the Kevin Harvicks and those who were just getting going. And what always struck me, and I've always remembered this, were how in the media center, it, to me it was like the race car drivers, right? You, you, when young race car drivers come along, the great ones will, will put your arm around you and say, all right, let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Why did you do this? You know, don't do that anymore. Okay, do it this way. And for my people in the media center, we had Barney Hall and we had Tom Higgins and we had Steve Wade and, and we had Ken Squire and, and no one was bigger than Ken. You know, you're talking about me showing up in the nineties. Now he was on CBS and on the weekends when he wasn't on CBS, he was on TBS. And when he wasn't on either one of those, uh, you know, he's on the radio. And so he was the voice of the sports and for him to put his arm around me and say, you need to not do this or you need to keep doing that. The fact that he would do that without me even asking, because I was too scared to ask. Um, that's my last memory it, it, or, or is the advice that he gave me then. Um, I got a story that just went up on ESPN.com five minutes ago. And, you know, it ends with three of the things that he told me as a media member to always remember. And, and I've always remembered ever since. I was going to say, and, 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 for those watching here live on YouTube, like definitely go check out that article. I will after uh, after we we go live here. But uh, and it sounds like you allude to it in uh, the story that you put out. But like some of those examples, like don't do this, don't do that, or do this, do that. Do you remember like any specific pieces of advice? Um, yeah, I mean, what I remember all the time is is he would say, you know, never forget. As big as this sport gets, above all else, it's about common men doing uncommon things. Yeah, you know, and and he always, you know, one of the one of the last conversations I had, I think, might be the last time I talked to him. You guys know, I always, I'm always wearing like Star Wars and, and yeah. uh, Marvel stuff, and I had this Captain America ring I wear all the time. And and Ken grabbed my hand and he pointed at the ring, and he said, he said, you know, it, it's 
no wonder you like superheroes. He said, because we're surrounded by them all the time in the garage. <laughs> and he's right. And, and one of the things that he told me years ago was, he said, you know, um, your job is c- to connect every man with Superman and Superman with every man. And, and it was that idea. And the other thing, and, and this is, I've applied this to writing, I've applied it to broadcasting, all that was he always says, don't settle for ordinary words of description when extraordinary words are available to you. And if you go back and listen to his, not even, not even his most memorable moments as a broadcaster, just go listen to like lap 71 yeah. of yeah. the 1984 Daytona 500. And, and it's not just this guy's making a pass for the lead. He explodes into the lead or into the lead, you know, and it's not just that guy blew an engine. He detonated, he, he grenaded an engine and it detonated like, like he would always use those extra words to make the moment feel bigger, you know, sometimes even than it actually was. Uh, That's just, that is brilliant. I mean, the two things you said there, and, and there's one thing that I think translates to today, especially you can comment on this, uh, you know, currently following the sport among many others. It's like, it was never lost on Ken the extraordinary efforts that these race car drivers are going through. And sometimes we forget these guys are badasses. Mm-hmm. You know, at yep. the end of the day, that is that is that is why we watch. That is why we tune in. Sometimes we don't play into that as much. That's the thing of brilliance that I think, uh, man, we need to follow that. We need to follow that today. Not saying we don't, but, I mean, it was never lost on him, that, that side of it. Yeah, and, commun- and communicating that, like that was yeah the the, the big thing that, that Ken always would remind you of, and, and and anybody who ever worked with him, you know, he would tell you all the time, you know, it was, it was, the guy at home on his couch watching the race needs to appreciate the fact that these men and women behind the wheel could die at any time, right? right. And the and the people that go over the wall in pit stops, you know, they make they make what is the least routine ever look routine yeah. and, and he says so we have to remind them of that all the time and and you know the great ones i think about barney hall i think about paul page the voice of the Indy 500 forever um you know i think about ken you know um you know but they they have an ability to you'll be in the other room best compliment i can give a broadcaster is sports broadcaster if you're in the other room you know making a drink or washing dishes or whatever they can do just the right thing with the inflection in their voice mm-hmm. or just the right thing with their choice of words to make you run back into the room because and, and only at the right time. You don't, you don't do it all the time. You just do it when it deserves it. And that's what Ken was always the master of. And, and all these broadcasters, Mike joy. I mean, you know, my friend, Mike Massaro, all, the, the people that all grew up learning under, uh, you know, all the guys at MRN, they moved it. They learned under Squire and they learned that, which is, you know, you can't you can't mash the gas all the time vocally, but when you do, let them know at home. All right, mm. you need to pay attention right now. Absolutely, uh, Ryan. This is Dalton here. I do social media for Dirty Mo. Um, yeah, man. But I just wanted to uh, add to that point that you made. You know, Ken was part of uh, captivating the senses of our audience. You know, there was the visual aspect of the cars going around the track, the audio of him, and uh, you know, obviously, if you're at the track, the smells of rubber and gas and and all of that. Um, and I think that plays into people like me who who do write for um, a living and just, you know, you made a great point earlier of like, you have the opportunity to use these extraordinary words to, you know, communicate with the public. And um, it's it's amazing. We were talking about right before we got on the phone with you, how someone that you didn't even realize impacted you has impacted you in a way. So um, I, I guarantee that there's times where I could look back on my career and say that, wow, that was almost a squireism that I, I kind of stumbled yeah. upon. Um, but outside of that, I did want to ask you um, if there was a marquee moment uh, or a squireism um, that you can recall that stood out to you over his career um, in NASCAR. Well, I mean, the, the answer to that is always going to be the 79 Daytona 500. Yeah. And, and it's not you, you go back and watch that. Oh, gosh, I've watched it so many times. But you go back and watch that, and if you listen to what he said, it's the perfect example of listening to what he says because it wasn't what everyone remembers is, and there's a fight, right? When they, when they cut, you know, so Richard Petty's rolling down uh, the pit lane and headed to Victor Lane, and the crew's all over the car, and then all of a sudden Ken goes, and there's a fight. 
But it wasn't just that part. That's the part everyone remembers. But then in a very small group of words, I mean, he says, and there's a fight. And he says, between Kel Yarborough and Donnie Allison. And then what I always remember is him saying, their temper's overflowing. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and then he says, they're angry. And then he says, they know they have lost and what a bitter defeat. And then he <laughs> then he shuts up. And so he tells everyone so much in such a short period of time. And that's what I go back to. Like, again, it's, it's that idea of don't use, you know, ordinary words when, when extraordinary words are available to you. And it's just finding, you know, the greatest challenge, you guys know this, the greatest challenge with us, with this sport, is that we go back to the same racetracks. Um, you know, we cover the same 40 you know, guys in the Cup Series all the time. Um, you know, we're, we're dealing with the same – no, four tire pissed off or two tire pissed off, but it's finding different language to express those things. Mm-hmm. It's the, been the biggest challenge of my career in 30 years, which is finding new ways to say a guy took the lead, right? And Ken would do it every single weekend, and he'd do it five different ways during a race. He was like a human thesaurus. And so that we take for granted. Like to your point, these things happen and you hear these things, and it's so good and it's so smooth. It's like It's like he would say about pit stops. These guys are taking an impossible situation and making it look very routine. That's what Ken did. I mean, he did it every time he's in front of a microphone. McGee, what are some of your favorite squireisms that he had over the years? Well, I have shamelessly, and he knew this. I have shamelessly used, you know, the grenade. He grenaded it. In. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's too good. I mean, that's you know, and again, <laughs> it, it tells you a whole lot about that. You know. Uh, he grenades the engine and detonates it at the start finish oh, line. Oh yeah, yeah. And and I love when he, that. he would always talk about when a guy, um, you know, back in the slingshot days in the eighties, when you know they all you know, CBS always did the Daytona five hundred, and they'd all they usually do the Talladega the the second Talladega race, and back then you knew the slingshot move was coming, so you'd spend fifteen laps waiting on the number two guy, to finally make his move. And so as a result, you know, the number two guy would always have to, at one some point, have to step out just a little bit, and he's trying to get air into the engine. Otherwise, it's going to, you know, it's going to overheat and blow. And he would always talk about um, guzzling up the air. <laughs> or, you know, or, or, you know, gall- you know, he gallops out, and now he's, uh, he's gobbling up the air. And that car is gobbling up the oxygen. And I used to love that because, you know, it humanized a race car, which, you know, that car's out there eating, man. And it's, uh, you know, the kids <laughs> now will say, you know, right? Uh, we're gonna we're gonna eat, man. They're eating. That's yeah. He said he said that forty years ago. Man, uh, one of my favorites is uh, you know similar to like the Daytona, like when they were all kind of in a line. They're choo choo training down the back straightaway. <laughs> I <laughs> love it. that one, man. Yep, that's it. Well, uh, and listen, Great American Race. That's Ken. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it. That's him. You know, it, it's um we, we we take it for granted now. It's just what we call the race. But that's um again, that's him taking. The Daytona 500, which didn't need another name, because it's the Daytona 500, and and he he came up with that, the Great American Race, and now, um, you know, you can just say that, and people automatically know that you're talking about the Daytona 500. I have a, I kind of have a list of squireisms. Uh, when someone crashed out, hopes have evaporated. Yeah. Uh, spinning down the back straightaway, spinning, splashing down the back straightaway, slithering and sliding along. Slipping and sliding through cars, resting beautifully in third. Like, ah, and the list goes on and on. But, yeah, so many great ones. Uh, McGee, the, the Oklahoma land rush. Yeah, the Oklahoma yeah, ran, land one. rush. The, guy, that was the guys a great would one. spread out on the back stretch at Talladega in particular. <laughs> they'd spread out, you know, they'd be four wide, three deep, and he would say it's an Oklahoma land rush. He used that one a bunch. You, you know, said, never got old. You said detonate, the engine detonates, right? Yep. Yeah, like I, I a think, grenade. Yeah, here's like a, there's here's one here's... he hand grenades himself to lead or something. Like nobody talks That's like a... that. They, that is so yeah. Ken Squire and it's beautiful. Yeah. Anyways, McGee, thanks so much for uh, jumping on. It's it's uh, great to hear from you. Those Ken Squire stories. I mean, even just you telling me some of the lessons that he taught you, man. I'm gonna I'm gonna apply some of those. So no, no, you can, I apply I apply that 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 extraordinary why so ordinary words. Yeah, I literally I use that every single day of my life. I mean, and it's so, uh, especially yeah, for you one. as a sports writer. Yep. And and for us working in sports and around athletes, it's like you 
sometimes it gets lost too often that yep. these people are extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So yep. yeah, that that's that resonated with me a lot. So anyways, uh, McGee, thanks so much for coming on. We'll let you go, and uh, man, we got to get you on more often. It's good to hear from you. Anytime, boys. I appreciate it. Thanks. See you, thanks, man. Awesome. You know, you just probably people. I when I was listening to his Hall of Fame speech, he probably if if I took a drink every time he said people, my beard be gone. He because <laughs> that's but he cared about the people of the sport and he understood that the sport without the people is it's nothing. And that was so much of my conversation with Ken. And every time I in, in such a Ken Squire fashion, it was beautiful. Every time I asked him a question, kind of about him, he always found one of those extraordinary characters that he loved to cover and he, he he told the story about them so travis like to your point he just absolutely loved the stars and heroes of the sport of nascar someone just brought up a good one uh a good squireism in the chat that that daryl waltrip was holding on to the lead like a hammerhead shark that ah, is so good i mean hope is, a, brilliant, hope is man. evaporated is one that you can apply Anywhere. to any sport yeah like absolutely amazing and uh, uh, McGee's article, if you go to his Twitter account, it's up there. So go uh, I will after this that. and go read that because yeah. it's. Uh, I was just trying to skim through during the interview to see if there's anything, and it's it's a good one. Yeah, man, that's so good. Like, uh, I, and this is me just reacting real time to mm -hmm. like that. And obviously, you know, we knew from Ken like that was that was his big thing is uncommon man, do common man doing uncommon deeds. But the way McGee teed it up and the way he shared that Ken told him how to follow it's like that's how you that's how you got to do There's it another one tell grandma to put her teeth in her pocket <laughs> yes yes so actually when i talked to dave moody that was his favorite one and uh and it sounds like we've got another we've got another person coming in uh rick allen of nbc nascar and nbc is joining us here on dirty mo live and uh I, I think tim's is hooking up the phone and i think we got him rick do we got you you got me, Andrew. How are you, bud? Doing good. How are you? I am well. So uh, we're, we're live here uh, sharing stories of Ken Squire, you know, obviously one of the greatest NASCAR broadcasters to ever do it. I know he has uh, crossed paths with you guys at, at NBC and, and you yourself um, many times. So uh, just first of all, uh, you know, Ken Squire, you know, what, is he, what does he mean to you? Well, you said one of, I think Ken Squire was the best. Yeah. Uh, I think he set the standard that all of us have tried to, you know, come close to, but, um, just Ken was, Ken was that guy who, uh, when we would have a production meeting, uh, especially over the last couple of years at NBC, um, when he would walk into the room, everybody would just feel different because you knew you were in the presence of greatness. Like we all kind of knew that the reason we all had jobs was because of him. Yeah. And that was just the aura that he brought into a room with him. Uh, and then just, you know, he, everybody, everybody always talks about, you know, his storytelling and everything, but really just his voice, just <laughs> the way he would deliver a sentence even in a production meeting or just talking to you casually. Yeah. You were just, you were just in awe and you were, it was like you were taken aback to, you know, the great calls of all time that he was a part of. And you just felt like you were there and with him. And it, it was really, he just had a presence about him and was a, a really great person and was generous with his time and his advice. And uh, just a, really fun person to be with um, just because you knew that you could, you know, you could kind of just absorb his presence and, you know, what he was able to do for the sport. And so just a, you know, a big loss, obviously for the sport, for uh, his family, for all his friends. Um, but it, it, he changed this sport um, and he brought this sport to prominence. And so I'm just thankful that, you know, I was able to work, with him and then also just call him a friend we uh we had a great conversation just before you jumped on with ryan mcgee who was sharing us some of like the best advice that ken squire gave him and you know the biggest thing that that we took away from it was ken seemed to find a way to make 
a common person doing uncommon deeds seems so extraordinary. And that was like the biggest lesson McGee has taken away from Ken. Like, what do you, obviously, as a play-by-play broadcaster, someone who is in the same role that, that Ken used to do, what are some of the takeaways, lessons you've learned from Ken over the years? I think just the little details. I think the, you know, when he would tell everyone uh, somebody's hometown or he would, you know, just give a little detail yeah. about someone that that there was a connection then. Then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm connected to this person <laughs> because of that little detail. And those are the things that I feel like I learned from Ken that he uh, just it was easy for him. Like it was that was part of his vocabulary to just mention, you know, somebody's hometown or, uh, you know, somebody's relative or, or something about a person that you just you're like, oh, OK, uh, I, I get it. I understand. Um, and so it, that was the thing that I think I took from Ken is just those just give us a little nugget about someone that connects us with them. And I've tried to utilize that in every broadcast I've ever done. And so, you know, he's had an influence on all of us um, in different ways. And we all probably take a little nugget of knowledge that Ken has given us. And we all try to, you know, use that to the best that we can. But that's what Ken was. He was full of nuggets of knowledge of the way that I think we all wanted to just present the sport to the fans. Rick, you know how hard it is to call the ending of a race. What do you make of Ken in 1979 calling that Daytona 500? Because he didn't miss a thing, and you know he didn't have all the screens and everything that you guys have now at your disposal. Like, what do you just make of that that ending of that race as a play-by-play announcer? Well, I think one of the things that made Ken great was things didn't overwhelm him. And that's another thing that, you know, you try to take from Ken is that you have to be in the present and you have to just, you know, convey what people might not understand uh, that are watching. Just give them a little bit of information. But he also knew to lay out. And at the end of races, you know, that especially the 79 race, you know, there was a big wreck on the backstretch, but he also knew that you've got to call the end of this race because that's extremely important, but then get back to what took place on the backstretch, which involved, you know, the wreck and a fight, you know, and emotions are, you know, overwhelming. And I mean, it just, (laughs) that, those are the things that you just, you want to make sure as a broadcaster that you pick up on the little things that happen. And in so few words, if you can express kind of a way to get people to feel what is happening or what they're seeing. And I think that's what I try to do at every ending of every race I call. And I think that's what Ken, you know, did magically, uh, especially there in 79 when he brought NASCAR to the world. Definitely, Rick. I mean, uh, we've been sitting here all day kind of going through what our favorite Squireisms are, and even our YouTube chat has been filling some in. Someone said earlier that uh, Daryl Waltrip was uh, commanding the lead like a hammerhead shark. Uh, Do you have any specific ones off the top of your mind that you can remember that stick out to you? Well, there's there's plenty. And if you talk to the guy who owns the studio you guys are sitting in, he (laughs) actually, when he started broadcasting, with NBC, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he had a notebook and he wrote down like a full page of Squireisms. And that was, and he told me about it when he, when he did it, he said, you know, I'm just gonna, I want to write these things down or I want to try to incorporate them because Squire was, he was the standard. He was the, the guy. And so he wrote down a ton of them. I, I mean, you think about the Oklahoma land rush or uh, he coined of obviously the great American race or the Alabama gang. Um, you guys just use one of the lines that he had, you know, said common men doing uncommon things. Yeah. Uh, lined up down the backstretch, like a freight train. Um, you know, just so many things. I, I, I think one of his best lines that, you know, encompassed uh, the way that he could use words to make you feel 
And I think when he said, whatever stock car racing is, Dale Earnhardt was. Yes. Mm. Yes. And I just, you, you just immediately, you just feel that. And I think everybody associated Dale Earnhardt immediately with the entire sport. And it was because of a very calm, I mean, just a, a simple line, a simple line that, that we heard um, Ken say, and it just, it brought it all full circle. You know, whatever stock car racing is, Dale Earnhardt was. Gosh, yeah. <laughs> it's it, powerful. It's brilliant, like the simplicity, yet how powerful that was. Um, yeah. We, uh, we got a comment from our YouTube chat. Josh Briggs wanted to know, like, what was it like sharing the booth with Ken during Darlington Throwback Weekend 2015, I think through 2017, um, and kind of, you know, giving the handoff to them. Uh, I think it was during stage two. You could correct me if I'm wrong, but, like, what was that whole experience like with Ken jumping on the, the NBC broadcast? Well, you know, I've always – I try to stay as professional as possible <laughs> uh, throughout the whole broadcast – but I think if I remember correctly, I remember Latart, uh, once we had thrown it over and I think it came back to us, Latart was like a little kid and he just said it. And, I, and that's probably one of the best things about Steve, too, is he'll <laughs> just speak whatever comes to his mind. But he said, <laughs> I can't believe we just threw it to like Ken Squire or uh, yeah. I can't believe Ken Squire just threw it back to us. And it was it was so surreal because you think, you know what? That's right. It's he's the greatest that's ever done it. And we're a part of the same broadcast that he's a part of. And it was just, it was so much fun to just listen and be a part of that. Um, and you know, it was an honor. It was an honor to be the same broadcast that he was a part of. And, and we had, like I said, that was probably where I got the closest to Ken was mm. during production meetings or, um, uh, Anytime we'd be sitting in the production trailer and just talking, just conversing. And that's where, you know, his you just try to soak in everything that he says and just his mannerisms and his the the tone of his voice, the the pitch, the I mean, the rhythm, just so many things that he did that has really just set the standard for what we all try to do. What was your reaction when you found out that you'd be sharing a booth with him? Were you nervous or what was going through your mind knowing that <laughs> you're going to be sharing it with the legend in a go? Not, not nervous. Um, <laughs> but if I remember the first time, I believe I tried to incorporate a squireism um, to bring him into the broadcast. Uh, and so it was, it was a lot of fun. I mean, just a, it was an honor just to be on the same broadcast with him and, uh, and he downplayed everything. You know, he was mm. even when you know he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. We we talked uh, backstage, and just he would downplay everything and make you feel comfortable. So you know, as a broadcaster, you felt like, I mean, I, I felt like I was supposed to be there, and that's that was one another one of the great things that Ken was able to do is just make you feel comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Well, Rick, thanks so much for uh, taking time out of your day to uh, share some Ken Squire stories. Uh, congrats to you guys and the NBC team on on finishing a, a fantastic NASCAR season, and uh, it, it was great to hear from you. Thank you, guys. I, I want to leave with what Eric Jones posted on Twitter. Yes. I don't know if everybody else has done it, but yes. he wrote pretty sad news this morning. He voiced the generation – and will never be replaced. We'll miss you, Ken. Sincerely, that Jones boy. Ah, uh, <laughs> it's too good. Brilliant. That's so good. That is so good. <laughs> it was awesome. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thanks, Rick. Thank Thanks, you, Rick. Rick. Well, awesome. uh, yeah. That was again more great stories from Rick Allen. So, like, he shared a booth with him. You were in his house doing the interview. What was mm -hmm. that like? I mean, it was. Like I said to McGee, I've I've said it on Twitter and and you know just a handful of people. Like it it was such an unbelievable experience. The entire Squire family, you know, Ashley, his daughter, Pam, his caretaker. Like they truly made us feel like home. And like this, the the next level production man. Like it's it was in his house. We were setting cameras up in his living room. You know. 
while he was eating breakfast, we were getting set up. Like we were, they they allowed us into his space, and, and just how gracious they were throughout the entire thing. Ashley, she's like, she, hey, I'm going to grab breakfast. You want to get anything? Like I, I truly felt like I was part of the Squire family, and that's the one thing I'll always remember. I mean, heck, ever since that day, Ashley Squire and I have been, in, you know communication, just checking in on each other, she loves the stuff, hey, hey, great, I saw a video with Dale, and Dale Jr. download, that was awesome, it's like, I truly feel like, you know, I'm, I'm part of the family now, and, and that's just how they treated everybody, and, and, and how Ken treated people, you heard McGee and, and uh, Rick Allen say the same thing, it's just, th- they really made people feel comfortable, and that's, that's how we felt, at least shooting the, the next level production there. That goes to Travis's point earlier when Ken was talking about it in his Hall of Fame speech that it was all about the people. And yeah. I mean, you're, you're a testament to that of, you know, just being able to infiltrate his space and ask him, prod him with questions and he was happy to answer them and he was happy to talk to you. And that's one of the things that, you know, before this, I didn't know much about Ken Squire before working here. Obviously, I knew from racing's past and his history, but diving into the stuff that you did, um, Man, just to hear him at the end say, you know, I'm glad I got to talk to you. Yeah. Should be the other way around. You know what I mean? Like, in a way, it should be like you're glad to talk to him. Um, but, man, what a guy. And for him to be able to have us all come together like this just shows how important of a man he was. So, yeah, I, I wrote I wrote details down. For, I have a I, I have like an app that I have on my phone yep. that I just like every day. Just a little journal entry. What did I do? You know, and I, that. Ken Squire Day was like three pages long, of just <laughs> details. What was that like, like going up there? Were you, like, what were your emotions? Um, you know, this was the. I I knew it was a big deal. I mean, to say I wasn't nervous is a lie. Like, I wanted to make sure I could capture the interview and and hit the right stories the best possible way. So, um, I, it was important for me to make make sure that I. I showcase Ken in the best way possible. Um, and, uh, I mean, it, it really, after it all went down, I mean, he made it easy on me with just being able to share stories. And I'll never forget, like, after we wrapped the interview, before the interview, he just wanted to share stuff, man. Like, it didn't matter if the cameras were rolling or not. Like, he was just telling stories left and right. And I really think that's just, that speaks to who Ken Squire is and was. Like, he was the best storyteller, you know? Um, but the little details I remember, like, in the morning, like we said, we were setting up while he was eating breakfast. Well, he had the radio station on to WDEV, which was the radio station he cut his teeth you know, through, and if I remember correctly, it was like, it was one of those radio programs where people would call in with stuff to sell, you know, it was that type of like small town radio Mm. show, and I remember there was some guy, he called in to WDV to sell his aluminum ladder, and like that was was the type of programming, you know, that was on in the morning that Ken would eat breakfast to, it was If you're watching it right now, there's a photo. Oh yeah, we've got some photos up on the screen, that's our entire crew, his living room, Um, he loved... His dog, Matilda, oh my God, he absolutely loved her. Uh, she would come <laughs> right up next to him and sit down, and he would pet her, pet her head. Oh, you're such a good girl. Like, he loved her. And, uh, you know, she was barking. She wanted to sit next to Ken during the whole interview, so she had to go outside on the porch. And actually, if you go and watch the interview, there are many moments, I think we've got it up on screen, where she is at the back porch, and you can visibly <laughs> see her. Yeah, so there's there's uh, Ken and his pup. dog, and uh, yeah, if you go to the interview, there's certain parts she will lay down at the back porch and just wait for Ken mm. to wrap up so she can come back inside and uh, spend time with him. It was just little details like that. That was uh, it was really cool to just be in 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 his house and environment. There was two things that were evident in your interview. He loved NASCAR because he was like baseball or tennis yeah like he loved yeah he loved nascar and he loved vermont and looking at these photos i can see why at his place why he loved this is a beautiful scenery but the passion also it struck me someone from vermont of his passion for nascar was interesting and think about where the sport is it wasn't just a great announcer think about mrn if not for him yeah he created a track like he wasn't just someone that like wasn't up like a announcer that 
you know, was the next one to, and became the greatest. Like he helped build this industry. Rob uh, in the YouTube chat says, I grew up in Waterbury, Vermont, listening to WDEV, uh, especially when there was a snowstorm, hoping to hear my school was canceled. Uh, and uh, Ken would announce the schools. How That's cool better than that I be. ever Could had. Could you imagine Ken Squire delivers you the great news that yeah. school's canceled for the day? Like, that's amazing. I had some random <laughs> dude, like, saying my school's canceled. You guys, you had Ken Squire. Like, that's not yeah, fair. I wonder yeah. what Squireism he used. Like, there's a blanket <laughs> on the ground. Yeah. What, yeah. Kind of, what kind of Squireism would he use? The buses to, uh, are cancel. slipping and sliding across the, like, it's got to be. You know what I mean? It's not just uh, like, oh, no, William Henry High School isn't going. No, there's no it's way. It's definitely a whole story. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Rob, I want to hear you comment in the chat. Like, how did he announce that school was canceled? <laughs> it's got to be in the most Ken Squire way possible. Um, but, yeah, and then, and like I said, Ashley Squire was so great. Like, she showed us around Thunder Road, obviously the track that Ken made. We went to WDEV, the radio station, even had – lunch at Ken's favorite restaurant which was right around the corner from WDEV so like we were embedded in this small town it was super cool small town guy with a nationwide worldwide voice yeah, and he never left home either mm. which is super cool yeah that is really really cool true to his roots and um man I feel like we could sit here and do this all day I would love to hear some more squireisms uh from the chat if they can find any I saw one earlier that was uh uh, from the 1990 Daytona 500, Dale Sr.'s leading the race, and Derek Cope is right behind him, and Ken goes, is there anyone that can cope with the man in black? <laughs> you know, like made a point to be, say, cope, you know, with Derek Cope right on uh, his tail. Oh, yeah. That's clever. That's super clever. Um, I mean, to me, the moments that will always stick out for this Ken Squire conversation were – and you see a little bit of it, mm. but it was his quick wit and humor. And he had such a dry sense of humor about it. And he's like, if you caught it, it was the funniest thing you've ever heard. Because he wouldn't smile. He wouldn't, like, you. I mean, his delivery was spot master on. Master of delivery, man. He was a master yeah. of, of that type of delivery. But, uh, like, after the interview, we asked, like, hey, can we get a picture? And he's like, no. And we actually, this is at the end of our full YouTube video. It's think, like the post credit scene. I think scene. you know what? I think you might need to just tell people to go watch it. Yeah. I would I think I they need show to. your hand. It's I, so fun. I don't want to. It's good. so You're not going to do it justice. So you, and I, I, you know, we you share can, an office but. together, and Curlin is losing his mind the <laughs> other day. And he's like, this is funny. I'm like, Andrew, it better be funny. A lot of stuff that Andrew says is funny sometimes isn't. I call him <laughs> chuckles because he chuck Like, I'm like, this better be. And it. It had me rolling. So, like, do not say, do not say it. People, just go and watch it. Like, I promise you, it'll be worth it. Um, the one thing we talked about the 1979 is he was just so calm in that mm -hmm. he did. And then, well, if people don't know, he's also directing at the end, being a spotter because the camera's not in the right spot. Yeah, and uh, I think we've got Brandon Brown. Our uh, old DBC editor and producer who uh, wanted to come on and, and share some Ken Squire stories. Brandon, good to hear from you. How you doing, man? I'm doing well, man. We're just up here at South Boston Speedway. We're doing some lovely postseason accounting work. And, oh, fun. Uh, scheduling work and preparing for next season. And, um, yeah, obviously, you know, uh, we're up here in South Boston now, and I miss you guys. I miss yeah, you guys we miss you too. We miss you, man. Same. Travis yeah, still I isn't guess. over the whole baloney thing. <laughs> I know, but uh, we'll we'll bring him up here to South Boston. We'll get him a baloney burger <laughs> with some, you know, some peppers and onions and mustards, yep. and he'll he'll turn his tide right away. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. How are y'all doing? We're doing we're doing good. We've been uh, we've been sharing our Ken Squire stories, and uh, by the way, and Brandon, I want to ask you. You know, earliest memory of Ken Squire, but I want to share mine. It's a super quick one. Uh, I remember, gosh, it was 2018, 2017, the July Daytona race when Ken was doing some work with NBC. He was in the media center, and I had to introduce myself to him. And so I walk over, hi, Mr. Squire, my name's Andrew Crone. Like, I, I want to be what you are one day. And, uh, you know, I love everything you've done for the sport. I kind of, you know, gave my whole pitch and appreciation. And he just goes, oh, shit, we got another one. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, oh, it was, man. And it was like, the, I'll never forget it. It was so, it was the perfect, you know, we were talking about Ken's quick wit. Like, that was the best way to meet Ken Squire ever. So, that was my that was my earliest memory. Brandon, like, do you have an earliest Ken Squire oh. memory? All right, well, I've, oh, I've got I've got my early early memories from my childhood, but I'll yeah. give you mine mine from when I actually met him. I met him one time, and he was doing the PA for the Coca Cola 600 weekend, and I was up I was up in the media center. I was there. This was my first experience doing NASCAR media anything. Jenna Fryer was, uh, went to West Virginia University, and she came to speak at my class, and I was like, I've got to go shadow her. I've got to do something. So she invited me to the. Uh, Coke 600 weekend, and I was up in the press box with Jim Utter learning how to cover what was then the Nationwide Series <laughs> in 2008. And Ken, I guess, was doing the PA or something, and, and they had the media buffet between the rooms. And I go, and I'm getting my food like before the race or during a break or something, and I look to my left, and it was Ken Squire. And Ken <laughs> was the reason that I went to broadcasting school. Wow. Ken was one of my absolute heroes as a child. And I'm when I say hero, I mean hero. Like I just I uh, he shaped my childhood, and we'll <laughs> get into that in a second. But um, I just I look, and he's just you know getting his food at the buffet, and I'm like shaking because I was just <laughs> starstruck. This is my hero. Um, and and I just I looked at him, and I'm like, hi, Ken, Brandon Brown. I'm kind of like you like i had to introduce myself i had to tell him how important he was yeah. to me yeah and of course he's got to get back to the to the uh room and he drops his drops his food right there on the on the counter and he he turns he shakes my hand he looks at me right in the eye and he goes good to know you and yeah. he, he didn't give me a smart like answer like he gave you <laughs> but, but but it was just he shook my hand and he picked his food up and then he went on his way and i'm like <gasps> yeah Oh my God. Like, like, and I know Andrew, I'm, I'm so jealous of you that you got to, to sit down with him and tell those stories and, and you did such a wonderful job with it. So I'll be infinitely jealous forever that you, you got to do that. But that's, that was Ken. Like that's, I'm so, so, you know, glad that he was like a part of my life watching him growing up. You mentioned those childhood moments. Like what are the, what are the memories of, of hearing, watching Ken Squire? Oh my gosh. I mean, obviously the, everyone knows the Daytona 500 and stuff. So I started watching NASCAR in, in, in 1993. Um, you know, his call of, of, you know, turning it over to Ned on that first lap mm. or, or sorry, on, on the final lap yeah. of that race, um, was kind of my introduction to, to Ken and how he was. But my memories of Ken came in, you know, in 1994 when I really started watching the race. My favorite, favorite race of all time is the 1994 uh, Miller Genuine Draft 400 at Michigan. And if you go back on YouTube and watch the intro to that race, like it always makes me teary eyed. And I'm getting a little emotional, like just <laughs> talking about it right now. Um, go back and watch that race. It was the Father's Day race. And he does this just this ridiculously eloquent open of the cbs broadcast talking about fathers and racing and the petties and the jarrett's and and they uh they intro and then they come in with michael and daryl walter but you just go watch it like i have listened to him i could recite it from memory right i'm not going to but <laughs> i can recite it from memory right now and my biggest thing for ken was was that like whenever you watched a race on CBS or TBS during the 90s when I did, he would make every single moment of any race that you were watching feel like the most important thing in the entire world was going on on that track at that moment. He just had that way. And, and that's, he's the reason that, that, that I became so enthralled with racing and the reason that I'm a fan is because of the way that he told those stories. And I would always look forward to, to a race on CBS and TBS because they, those races shaped my fandom because he was so great at what he did. I'm telling you, like what you just said right there, we had McGee, Rick Allen on earlier. And it's like, I knew, I knew this before, but the lesson, at least for everyone watching on YouTube and Brandon, you, you made it, a perfect another example of it is like just just really showcasing how elite and how special whatever you were watching was yeah yes you know oh my gosh well, i think uh, go ahead i was gonna say that i think that there's a lesson for that outside of nascar and you know like we i touched on this a little bit earlier but making every moment feel important yeah and man. you know like it's not we're not going through life you know blind where things are important every day and so 
you know, if Ken can do that in his professional work or if that can inspire someone like Brandon to want to be a broadcaster, it can also inspire you mm-hmm. to take every day and and make an extraordinary thing out of the opportunity within the ordinary, like Rick mm-hmm. Allen and McGee were both saying. Mm-hmm. So, um, man, I just love that. I love hearing well how said, he touched though. different people and, yeah. and just with his voice. It's so crazy. Now. Oh. Like, it's so <laughs> awesome. I was just going to say, yeah. th- there's so many announcers nowadays where they're either always high or they're just low. <laughs> And it's like, and McGee, I think it was Mickey who was saying, like, you want to be in the kitchen and be like, something's happening. Yep. Like, mm-hmm. and that's what he, like, you knew, like, if his voice elevated, like, it was for a reason. Like, he didn't right. waste words. Well, he knew when to stop talking. Yeah. Like, at, this, at the 79 500, he said, they're angry. Their tempers are, you know, boiling over. And then nothing. Yeah. And just watching fight. Like, that was, that's, there's an art to the like pause. He, it's, he's on that short list with, like, the Keith Jacksons of, mm-hmm. like, if you're going to get into this broadcasting career, like don't like the yeah, there's some good announcers right now, but you go watch, you know, Ken Squire and Keith Jackson and those people like and see how they handled yeah. games. Yeah, no, I mean, no, nobody could call a race like like if the announcers today, no, absolutely no disrespect to anyone because they're all very great. But no one today could call a race like Ken could in his time, like that style, that eloquence, that the way that he could spin a story. And, and make you feel like you were absolutely right in there with him and with the drivers, like um, all the phrases that he coined, but also simply just, you know, the, the way that he could position things like he, he would like, you would know where the drivers were from the, his prep yeah. work going into the broadcast. Like you would know where all the drivers were from their backstories. You would make, he would make you emotionally invested in in the people and then the product and he could make the most boring race because there were a few of them in the 90s still make make it exciting and make it feel like it was ridiculously important um and you mentioned like uh the way that uh, you know um he would position and and kind of make you feel like life was bigger um, I always, I, I never made it to the NASCAR broadcast booth, but I always tried to take with him or take with me, like the, his style into whatever I did on social media. I went back and looked, and if you look on the, uh, um, go back to the Chicagoland Speedway pages, um, I would always try to interject some things that Ken said in his broadcasts in my social media, <laughs> and it was just, just that was just his way. Uh, again, it's about making these race cars and racing's a weird sport where you see the car you don't necessarily see the driver right and ken brought the in-car camera over to nascar from australia and we talked about that in our next level interview one of my favorite quotes of his because these original in-car cameras 50 pounds dangerous um ken even said man if you roll over that thing will that thing will crush you and so I'm like, how did, mm-hmm. how on earth did you convince these drivers to agree to an in-car camera? And he said, on their faith and my good word. And <laughs> that was uh, like, that's good enough for me, I guess. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, because they were so heavy back in the day. Yeah, they were. So, And that's uh, like my favorite part of watching the races is the in-car camera. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, it's like Ken was the, f- I mean, he saw something in Australia because uh, they were doing the Bath- Bathurst 1000, mm-hmm. I think, mm-hmm. was the race that he saw. And he's like, we need that over here in NASCAR. So, I mean, uh, I forget, you know. I forget the name that was on the screen. But somebody said, if you were on the other side of a hall and you heard Ken's voice, you knew exactly who it was. Yeah. 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 Oh, yes, of course. I, I I don't know. I didn't get to listen to the first part of, of your live. I'm, obviously, I'll go back and listen to, to McGee and, and Rick Allen and those guys. But I, I, I would make the argument, and then maybe they made the argument, that, that Ken is could be the most influential person in NASCAR history because he of his work getting that Daytona 500 in 1979 on CBS, giving those people the opportunity to see this race. And that was really where the sport ascended. And then how he, how he nurtured it, how he called it, how he was an ambassador for the sport all the way through NASCAR's growth uh, up until you really didn't see him on the broadcasts anymore in you know when when in 2000 2001 when fox kind of took over yeah a hundred percent well brandon uh we thanks for uh taking some time out of your day share some ken squire stories it's like i feel like i'm 
I, I'm in the moment here listening to you talk about it, Ryan McGee, Rick Allen, of like, man, this guy was super special. So uh, thanks for coming on and uh, sharing some of your uh, Ken Squire memories with us. Absolutely. I couldn't, I couldn't not talk about <laughs> Ken. And uh, yeah, I would encourage anybody, go on YouTube, find those 90s and, and 80s CBS, TBS races that he called and, and, and just enjoy it, you know please do that for yourself because um it was awesome absolutely brandon brown good to hear from you gm of south boston and now <laughs> a great title and now see you guys see you brother see, see you man and now with nascar the archives like you can go back and rewatch those rewatch these races, races man like yeah that's awesome um yeah super cool and even like uh another squire lesson i learned early in our conversation is the law of exaggeration right if you're telling a story man Give them the good details, you know, especially like for radio, you got to you gotta paint a picture and, uh, you know, sometimes you over-exaggerate a bit. That's what makes a great storyteller. That's what it's all about. You know, that's yeah. one thing I have tried to, not that I over-exaggerate my stories. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. <laughs> but it's like telling a good story. You can learn a lot just by listening to how Ken Squire tells a story. I saw somebody else post that. Ken turned a radio into a TV. I saw that too. What a what a uh, line that he could turn a radio into but a TV. But when he was doing TV, wow. when he was doing that's TV the, though, that's the line, he man. knew that he didn't need to say all those words, and that's where he'd lay out. That's the brilliance. Is he could call radio and TV. That, that's two different yeah. things to do. I mean, I guess then he turned the TV into the racetrack and made you feel right there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, any closing thoughts for you guys? I have I have some of my own. Just but. um, you know. Rest in peace to a legend and, you know, thoughts and prayers of family and friends. Yeah, yeah. Ken's impact will be um, felt for years and years, decades to come. I, I was writing some stuff earlier for some of our social posts, and that was one thing that I thought of is that the great American voice will echo throughout NASCAR's history forever, and um, he definitely will. Hear me out here. I'm going to quote a song. It's a Luke Combs song, but I think it it, it – perfectly translates over to Ken Squire's legacy and it's the line I will but my song will never die mm -hmm. and it's kind of like Ken Squire's calls man that Daytona 500 call all those legendary moments man even when he's not here those calls will last forever and you know I've been chatting back and forth with his daughter Ashley and that has been her favorite part about seeing things this week and the love shown on social media. So if you really want to honor Ken's legacy, man, just keep sharing those things. The family loves to see that. They love the support and appreciation that has been sent out to them and, and the entire Squire family. So to keep Ken's legacy alive, man, let's just let's just keep replaying those great moments. That's the best way to do it. So And make the ordinary extraordinary. That's it. That's exactly it. So I think that's a great way to uh, to end this one. Thanks so much for tuning in. Ken Squire, man, we miss you, but uh, we'll always appreciate you. Thanks for tuning in during my live.